we're late enough already. They've closed the doors. You'll come. It's a medical school lecture. I want to see what the attraction is. The psychology of crime. What? Psychology of crime. Come on. I have a good mind to stay. Who's the lecturer? I'd stay if I were you. He only lectures once a week. Now you've got to stay. Up to this point in the present series of lectures, we've dealt exclusively with abnormal mentalities. I emphasize the fact that in civilized communities, 80% of our murderers and violent criminals were those whose minds had been conditioned by exceptional nervous stress and unhealthy environment. Last Friday, we dealt with the smaller group of strictly moronic criminals. And now we come to that much more interesting phenomenon, the sane criminal. The man who is prepared to pursue his own ethical convictions even to the point of murder. The man whose punishment is apt to weigh heavily on the conscience of society because his actions as likely as not have been inspired by just as great an integrity as those of the men who sit in judgment. At worst, he's an irresponsible opportunist. At the best, he's a man with a strong sense of justice even a mystic. I propose to relate the case history of a murderer of this class, a perfectly sane, valuable member of society. You better give him a fictitious name. Uh, it gives them all fictitious names, all the characters in this case. He was a surgeon. They called him Mr. Mr. Joyce, Mr. Michael Joyce. He was well thought of in the medical profession and had a house of his own in Harley Street. His marriage had been an unhappy one, and he'd lived apart from his wife for several years. Consequently, he threw all his energy and interest into his work. As a brain specialist, he operated in three London hospitals and had developed a technique which considerably reduced the mortality rate in this field. He was reserved in his personal relationships and had no close friends. His only relaxation was to sit at home and play the piano or go to an occasional concert. Otherwise, it was a life devoted solely to work. A life that by normal standards was unutterably lonely and empty. But he never recognized this himself until he met a woman called Emma Wright. When she first came into his consulting room, he hardly even noticed her. She was just an ordinary middle-class woman who happened to have a daughter who was going blind. Sit down, Mrs. Wright. Uh, Emma, let's have a look at this head of yours. I gather it was an emergency operation after an air raid. Yes. Now the eyesight's affected. The eye specialist said there was nothing he could do. Can you see well enough to read? Not really. I have the eye specialist report. Early optic atrophy. This is a fairly serious condition, Mrs. Wright. The thing for us to do is to take her into hospital, make a thorough investigation so as to establish the exact cause. You wouldn't mind that, Anne, would you? Would you? Will it hurt? No. We'll take good care of you. Do you want her to go in right away? I think she should. Anne, come over here. Sit down. We don't want the atrophy to become too far advanced. Now, Anne, I'm just going to look into your eyes. You see those two figures on the mantelpiece? Keep your eye on them. My face will get in between, but don't look at me. The personality of the child's mother remained for the time being a matter of no great importance. But after the child had been submitted to a series of tests, and X-rays had proved that her trouble was due to a small foreign body lodged anteriorly to the optic chiasma, it became obvious that a fairly serious operation was necessary, and the relationship between these two became inevitably less remote. Will it be very dangerous, the operation? To her life? Mm. There's always a risk with a major operation. How great a risk? The mortality rate with this operation is 1%. And if you don't operate? She'd go blind. Oh, if only my husband were here, he'd know what to do. I hate to go ahead without him. We might consider putting it off for a short time, if he's coming home soon. Not for several months, I'm afraid. In that case, I shouldn't advise it. Every week that we let it go, it gets progressively worse. I know. I know you're right, but... You don't think she... I mean, she couldn't be among the one percent. In my mind, there's no question at all. I've met this problem before on many occasions, always with complete success. 
I wish you felt you could trust me. It isn't that. I'll do what you say. Well, I suggest we leave Anne here at the hospital. She's comfortable. And I'll operate as soon as it can be arranged. All right? All right. There's nothing to it, Anne. We give you something nice to make you go to sleep. And when you wake up again, it's all over. Then you'll be able to see properly again. Oh, Mommy, they want to cut my hair off. But, darling, it'll grow again. Oh, must I stay here, Mommy? Mr. Joyce will take great care of you. Oh, don't go, please, Mommy. How would you like your mother to stay with you till you go to sleep? Can't she stay with me until I wake up again? She can stay with you all the time if she likes. Oh, yes, please, Mommy. He says you can. All right, darling, I'll stay. I'll see you later, Anne. I won't be a minute. to operate is often as nervous as a prima donna. This was exaggerated in the present case by the feverish devotion of the child's mother, which had conveyed itself to Michael Joyce and robbed him of that cold detachment which is the doctor's great strength. Never before had he been so acutely aware of the identity of the piece of human material he was working on as he took the scalpel and made the first incision and as the sister handed him the artery forceps. easily and the foreign body was located and successfully removed. The chief sufferer, of course, was the wretched woman who had been pacing up and down the waiting room for two hours. She broke down as soon as Michael Joyce came in and made his report and only pulled herself together when she remembered rather guiltily the promise she'd made to Anne to stay with her throughout the operation. She was anxious to get back to her before she came out of the anaesthetic. There was another woman in the room with her, whom she introduced as her sister-in-law, a Mrs. Catherine Howard, a rather overdressed young lady who seemed to have very little interest in Anne's welfare. They had to wait some weeks to find out whether the operation had actually succeeded in saving Anne's eyesight. Meanwhile, they shared the daily uncertainties and anxieties. Emma Wright depended more and more on the feeling of confidence which he gave her. And when it became obvious that Anne was on her way to recovery, she was tremendously grateful to him. A feeling which Michael Joyce did not mistake 
but he knew that his own interest in her was greater than it should be. Without admitting it to himself, he began to dread the day when the job would be completed, the day of the final examination, after which Anne and her mother were to return to their home in the country. Anne and I went to pictures last night, the first time for over a year. It was all coloured. Well, I don't suppose we shall see you again. I hope you will. I hope so, too. Not professionally, of course. The sun's come out, Mummy. We'll go into the park, shall we? Goodbye. Are you really going to the park? Yes, why? Do you mind if I go with you? Of course not. But oughtn't you to tell someone you're going out? I'll tell them when I get back. Then there can be no mistake about it. He should have said goodbye when their relationship came to its natural conclusion. But he couldn't bring himself to. She represented all the things that were so painfully lacking from a life devoted to textbooks and operating theatres. She was so simple and unaffected. She told him about Philip, her husband. How his work as a geologist had kept them apart for years at a time. And now he was going to give it up so that they could be together. She told him how they'd hoped for more children. Having only one, she'd become all the more nervous and possessive about Anne. They went on seeing each other and found they had the same tastes. They both liked music and fell into the habit of going to concerts together. Sometimes she'd come and play the piano at his house. guilty making you drive out all this way. It's all right. I really should have stayed in town, only I hate leaving Anne alone at night. I'm relying on you to show me the way. I don't know this part of the country. Oh, I know the road. Good. Wait a minute. And we lost? Oh, it's all right. That's our chapel. Your chapel? Yes, you can see it from my bedroom window. Draw up when we come to it. I must show it to you. All right. There used to be great ructions in the family about it. When the wind's in our direction, you can hear them singing. I rather like it. The sound drifts across and... Oh, I don't know. It's rather peaceful. Some people hate it. Kate was always trying to get Philip to sell the house. That was before she was married, of course. Then after she came back here, after her husband was killed, she started all over again. She says Clay always plays out of tune. Who's Clay? Our gardener. He plays the organ here. Kate thinks we ought to get rid of him because of it. Why? Does it affect his gardening? Oh, no. It's just that Kate thinks that if he hadn't a job, he might go and live in another district and then there wouldn't be anyone to play the organ. Who's Kate? My sister-in-law. You met her one day at the hospital. Did I? Don't you even remember the people you meet? I remember the important ones. The ones I want to remember. That's our house up there. There's something I've been wanting to ask you all the evening. Yes? It's just... Are you divorced? No. Diana doesn't want a divorce. Why do you ask? Oh, no reason. I just wondered. We ought to be going. It must be awfully late. When Emma came up to London for the day, she made a habit of calling in at Michael's house in Harley Street after the day's shopping. And often they'd have dinner together afterwards. Hello. Hello. Sorry I had to keep you waiting. I got messed up with my appointments this afternoon. It doesn't matter. Come and listen. What's it? The record Anne's made. It almost sounds as though she were a real pianist. I'm trying to think what this is. 
Madam, will you walk? Oh, yes. It's good. Is that really Anne? Well, of course it is. Quite a professional job. Shh. Oh, Daddy. I'll go back. Uh, that was a mistake. She always goes wrong there. But we're going to have another one made without any mistakes. She can play it, really. This is where she goes wrong. She used to play very well. After the accident, of course, she had to play from memory. I made her go on practicing. Emma, do you love your husband? I don't know how to answer that question. But you know why I asked? Yes. Oh, Michael, I don't know what to say. Philip and I have been together for so long. I love you, Emma. You shouldn't have told me. If we kept quiet about it, we might have gone on seeing each other. It wouldn't have worked. I suppose not. I wanted you to know. I did know, Michael. I've tried not to recognize it. I tried to tell myself that something would happen to make it all right. But I knew nothing could. It can never be all right. Neither of us is free or ever likely to be. There's nothing we can do about it. We won't see each other again after today. No. I'll miss you. Oh, Michael, so shall I. Dreadfully. difficult for them to end their association, though neither was happy about it. Emma's husband was giving up the work he liked so as to be with her, and she was torn between her loyalty towards him and her love for Michael Joyce. Finally, she decided to write to her husband and explain what had happened, and to ask him to release her. send it, can I? No, you can't. It would be too unfair. It's Anne I'm thinking of, of course. Yes, well, there's your answer. It certainly wouldn't be fair to her. There's only one thing for us to do, I'm afraid. Goodbye, Michael. No, don't come near me. We must never see each other again. And they never did see each other again. Established at the inquest that the fatal fall took place at about six o'clock in the evening. The only other people in the house at the time were the child, Anne, and a housemaid 
who testified that earlier in the afternoon, Mrs. Catherine Howard had visited the house. Did you see Mrs. Howard leave? Uh, yes, sir. I saw her get into a car and drive away. At about what time? Oh, a little before six, I should say, sir. And it was some minutes later that you heard a noise as of someone falling? Yes. That will be all, Miss Bond. Thank you. Repeat after me. I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That I will speak the truth. That I will speak the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. Nothing but the truth. You are Mrs. Catherine Howard. Yes. And your address is. I live at the Arcadia Hotel. Yes. And what was your relationship to the deceased? She was my sister-in-law. She was married to my brother Philip. When did you last see Mrs. Wright alive? About six o'clock on the evening of the accident. I was with her for about an hour. You had an engagement with her. Well, not exactly an engagement, but she knew that I might stop by. Was she actually expecting you to stop by? Well, she wasn't exactly expecting me, but uh, since my husband was killed, I'd been in the habit of popping in and out whenever I was nearby. What happened when you arrived? Nothing. Did you talk? Well, yes, we chatted for a while. About anything in particular? No, just talk. Did she seem worried? Well, on the contrary. She was very cheerful. She was looking forward to her husband coming home. Had she been suffering from ill health? Not at all. Then there was nothing in her manner to suggest that anything was wrong? Certainly not. Oh, but she did have a great fear of heights. She had a great fear of heights. Do you mean that she mentioned it on this particular afternoon? W well, no. Why did you mention it just now? Well, it seemed to me the only possible explanation for her falling out of the window. I see. What was Mrs. Wright doing when you left her? She was in her room. I think she was going to turn out her stocking drawer. Thank you, Mrs. Howard. That will be all. Come over here by me. Now, Anne, you understand what is meant by telling the truth, don't you? Yes. It's very important that you do, because I'm going to ask you a few questions, and I want you to answer them truthfully. Tell me, when did you last see your mother? It was a little while before I went to bed. Where was your mother? In her room. Did you go in and talk to her? I went to say good night. And did you say good night? Yes. Did your mother seem normal? Yes. Tell me, Anne, was there anyone with your mother? No. Nothing happened that seemed unusual to you? No. Thank you. That will be all. Repeat after me. I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That I will speak the truth. That I will speak the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Dr. Reynolds, is your name William Gaunt Reynolds? It, Do you practice in Downborough? Were you called in this case? Yes. What time did you get there? About 6.30 in the evening. <laughs> tonight, sir? Uh, no, um, uh, no, I've got to go. Very good, sir. Thank <laughs> you. 
Mrs. Catherine Howard in. And the party's in Mrs. Deaver's suite, room 29. Party? Oh, I'm sorry, sir. I thought perhaps you were one of the guests. Um, uh, yes. Yes, I am. Room 29. Second floor. We're in such a muddle, everybody seems to be here. I won't have to introduce you. Oh, look, there's Joan Scott Trotter. Joan, I want you to meet Mr... Uh, How do you do? Albert. But I can't bear to see people without anything in their hands. There. Thank you. Oh, dear, I might have known she'd turn up. Oh, darling, I'm so glad you were able to come. These are the ones we ought to avoid. All right, what's wrong with them? After Jenny Deaver's last party, Judy Hammond went blind. Permanently? No, she's over there somewhere. Why, there's Kate Howard, and on the day of the inquest. But she do it. Put the stuff for me somewhere, will you? Yes. Excuse me. You're being very unsociable. Why, there's someone here I know you'll adore. She's longing to meet you. Sylvia, darling, you don't know Peter, do you? I'm dying you to do? meet you. Got a drink? Good. What on earth is that waiter doing? Is your name really Sylvia? What's wrong with Sylvia? Nothing at all. Only mine isn't Peter. Excuse me, I must take this drink to someone. I just love that hat. Hello. Hello. That's the new wimp. Why, hello, Doctor. I never expected to find you at a cocktail party. I hardly expected to find myself at one. Have you been here long? No, I've only just arrived. You're looking very well. Oh, I'm an absolute wreck. I've been having the most awful time. I expect you read about it. My sister-in-law, Emma Wright, you know, she fell out of a window and got killed. Yes, I did hear about it. I've just come straight from the inquest. I wonder if I dare try one of these. I shudder to think what's in it. Catherine, poor dear. What really happened? Did you throw herself out to me? No, of course she didn't. Is one of those going begging? I'll die if I don't have a drink. No, I'm afraid this belongs to Mrs. Howard. You might find one over there, though. Now, don't go away, Catherine. I simply must hear it all. <laughs> you saved my life. I think you ought to keep moving if you don't want her to catch you again. Quite a good idea. My dear, you must give me the lowdown. My husband swears that someone pushed her out of the window and it's all being hushed up. Come in the corner in the quiet. I can't bear I it. can't let Haven't you got to down. telephone your mother? My mother? Oh, oh, yes, I've got to phone my mother. See you later, dear. Excuse, Excuse me. me. Kate, my dear, you're not going. Darling, I must. They're too gruesome. You're staying here for dinner. Well, don't rely on me. Oh, quick, there's that awful woman. See you later, dear. You're a menace. Catherine! Darling, you haven't got a drink. No. <laughs> not suitably dressed to be here. I ought to have changed, I suppose, but I've had such a hectic week, what with the inquest and everyone ringing up and asking silly questions about Emma. I do sympathize with you. All I know is she left me with a load of debts. Was Mrs. Wright in debt? Oh, not hers, mine. Oh. I wonder if they've got any potted shrimps. What's happened to Anne? Anne? How do you know Anne? I operated on her. Why, yes, of course, so you did. How silly of me. You know, I think I had one too many at that party. I almost forgot for the moment who you were. Well, what has happened to her? Oh, she's gone to Portsmouth. Emma's mother has a house down there. There's a dreary old miser, if ever there was one. She hates me, as if you cared. I do care. I'm most interested. You're just being very polite and sweet. Frankly, I'm bad for you. It's fatal to have a drink of Jenny Deaver. You never know what she's going to put in them. It'll pass off as soon as you've had something to eat. Tell me about the house. What's happened to that? What house? This is right. Oh, it's up for sale. Already? But well, we moved Anne out the night her mother died. Philip will never want to see the place again. It's empty now. You got any potted shrimps? I'm afraid not, madam. Lobster cocktail? Uh, yes, madam. Would it be very forward of me to hope that I shall see you again? If you'd held your breath a moment longer, I should have suggested it myself. Well? Well, uh, are you free tomorrow evening? I'll see that I am. All right, uh, same place, 
Six o'clock? In the bar? Wonderful. Good. Good night. Good night. He decided to visit Emma's empty house. He'd never been inside her home, and he felt that if he could see it, he might in some way find an answer to the problem of Emma's death. He looked around the grounds and tried to find some way of getting into the house. But there were no windows unlatched and the place seemed to be completely deserted, so he had to break in. This was the room where Emma had spent her leisure hours. Everything was just as it must have been when she was alive. Her piano and Anne's. He knew he was in Emma's room as soon as he opened the door. There was still the faint smell of her perfume. On the other side of the valley, he could see the little chapel that Emma had found so charming. That's what I should be asking you. I didn't know there was anyone here. No doubt you didn't. 
But that's no excuse for breaking into other people's houses in the middle of the night. You can be had up for this. Yes, I suppose I can. Are you looking after this place? I'm the caretaker. Hmm. Did you take anything that doesn't belong to you? No, certainly not. It's rather difficult to explain. I, uh... It's just that you haven't got a piano of your own, I suppose. It's all right, I believe you. No sensible burglar's going to start flexing the piano while he's on the job. Did you know the lady who owned this house? Know her? Why, I worked for her for ten years. I looked after the garden. Oh, are you the gardener who plays the organ at the chapel? Oh. Do you know about me? Oh, yes. <laughs> Look here, there's no point in our standing out here in the cold. I've got the kettle on. Would you like a cup of tea? There's nothing I'd like better. Come down to my room. I gather that Mrs. Howard didn't take very kindly to your organ playing. Mrs. Howard, poking her nose into everyone's business. Made the poor lady a nice dance, I can tell you. Shocking tragedy. Ever such a nice lady. I'm usually in bed by this time. If I'd broken in earlier, I might have played the piano in peace. If you picked the right night, you could have made yourself at home the whole evening. Oh, really? Yes. I always cycle over to my sister's on Fridays. Kind of breaks the monotony. Thanks for the information. If I were a burglar, I could use it. <laughs> You're no burglar. I can see that. I knew Mrs. Wright. I wanted to have a look at the scene of the accident. Accident? It were no accident. The coroner said it was. And what if he did? Does it seem likely to you that a lady would fall out of a window she'd been looking out of for ten years? A lady that was perfectly healthy and didn't suffer from a fear of heights, no matter what some people said at the inquest. Help yourself to milk. Thank you. She's a real devil, that Mrs. Howard. You seem prejudiced. It's not only me. Doris would bear me out. Sugar? No, thank you. And cook. Mrs. Howard lived here for a time after her husband was killed, and she'd never let Mrs. Wright alone. Always nagging and getting on her nerves. And Mrs. Wright was that soft-hearted, she was very easily upset. Yes, I know she was. And then there was a scene about the carpet. What about the carpet? Oh, she stole it, Mrs. Howard did. Stole the carpet? Mrs. Wright let on she gave it to her just to save Mrs. Howard's face, but we know different. They say Mrs. Howard got a tidy sum for it. Did she? I imagined Mrs. Howard was fairly well off. Well, she had a lot of money by her husband, but that didn't stop her trying to get more. Have another cup? No, thank you very much. I must be moving. Yes. Tried to get me the set just because she didn't like my organ playing. Are you fond of singing? It's a long time since I've sung. If you want to know what I think, Mrs. Howard pushed her. Well, I'm sure that's not true. She could do it. But the maid said at the inquest that Mrs. Howard left the house before it happened. Doris would want to keep it dark for Mr. Wright's sake. <laughs> well, for Mrs. Howard's sake, I hope you're wrong. First, he found it hard to credit the caretaker's assertion. But later, as he got to know Kate Howard, he couldn't entirely dismiss the idea. She was a hard, self-centered, brittle woman. And it did seem just possible that she had had something to do with her sister-in-law's death. Kate Howard was delighted with his attentions, and only too pleased to talk about herself. She appeared to be a woman with a grudge. First of all, when she had wanted to be a singer, her parents had refused to pay for her training. Her husband had been equally uncooperative. From the way she spoke of him, one would have thought that he'd chosen to die young solely in order to keep her short of money. And then there was her brother, Philip. She'd always resented the fact that he had the lion's share of her family's money. There were so many things she'd have liked to do with her life, she kept telling him. He tried to draw her out on the subject of Emma Wright, but here she was much more reticent. However, she did finally come out with an interesting statement. Emma had a lover. Oh, but that's not true. That surprises you, I suppose. How did you know? She told me. Did she tell you who the man was? No. I suppose I shouldn't have talked about her now that she's dead. Still, you asked, and now you know why I say that Anne will be better off without her. Where's Anne going to live? With me. With you? Oh, don't look so shocked. I can't exactly picture you looking after a child. Oh, don't be so sure of that. I'm full of unfulfilled maternal instincts. Are you? No. I've arranged for her to go to boarding school. I don't expect to hear of her again till the summer holidays. Come and sit down over here. You're such a long way away. Is her father satisfied with this arrangement? Oh, yes. He came with me to make a home for her. Did you call sending her to school, making a home? 
Now, don't you start on me. I've had quite enough trouble from Anne. She wants to be allowed to stay on with Emma's mother. Philip wants her to be brought up by someone younger, hence me. I see. When does she start her school? Monday. I've got her coming to town tomorrow to get her teeth fixed before she goes. It's a sickening responsibility, still it can't be helped. I presume your trouble will not go entirely unrewarded. Oh, no. Philip's making me an allowance to take care of her. I shouldn't have taken it on otherwise. Still, it's an awful nuisance. Poor little Anne. Don't waste your sympathy on her. What time is this dentist appointment? Why are you so interested? I was just thinking that you'd be free while she's there. So? If I were free at the same time, we might meet. Well, that's quite a thought. Kate was completely unsuspecting when he made an appointment to meet her for tea at the Savoy at four o'clock. He never had any intention of keeping this appointment. He had to see Anne. And he had to find a way of seeing her alone. My aunt told me to come and wait for her here when I finished with the dentist. Come in, will you? She's having tea somewhere. She's going to pick me up afterwards. Will you wait in here? I know this room. Bad time. I was told to wait here for Aunt Kate. Is it all right? I was expecting you. Your hair's growing nicely. Oh, it's awful. I thought it was about time you and I had a talk. What about? About you. Do you like the idea of going away to school? I don't mind. Do you... Do you like your Aunt Kate? Yes. Are you sure about that? Yes. Don't you trust me? Yes. Not very much. I don't know why you're asking me all these questions. I want to help you. A long time ago, you trusted me with something very important. What was that? Your life, Anne. Don't you remember? Yes. Why did you say at the inquest that there was no one with your mother the last time you saw her? Because there wasn't. That's not true, though, is it? Oh, I don't know what you want me to say. Your Aunt Kate was with her, wasn't she? Oh, leave me alone, please. What happened between Kate and your mother before the accident? It wasn't an accident. It was just the same as if I pushed her. You? It was my fault. How could it have been? I know it was. I sided against Mummy. I don't care what happens to me anymore. What did you do, Anne? You must tell me. I can't. You must. It's important. She made me promise not to. She said they'll send me to prison if they find out. Kate said that? Yes. Well, she'd no right to say it. No one can send you to prison if you tell the truth. What happened, Anne? You've got to tell me. I went up to Mummy's room to say good night. I've been playing in the garden since tea time. I knew Aunt Kate was with Mummy. And as I reached the top of the stairs, Aunt Kate was coming out of Mummy's room. She was angry. And she talked in a very quiet voice to me. She said she had something very important to tell me. Then she started. She said the most horrible things about Mummy, about Mummy and some man. There was going to be a divorce, she said, and I'd have to give evidence against Mummy. I'd have to tell him in court for Daddy's sake all the awful things Mummy had done. I suppose Mummy must have been listening all the time, because suddenly she told Aunt Kate to get out of the house. She wouldn't go. Mummy told me to come to her room with her, but I wouldn't. I don't know why. I was afraid, I suppose, and I believed what Aunt Kate had said. I believed it then. It was only afterwards I saw how wicked she was. I heard Mummy slam the door of her room when she went back in. I never saw her again. It was all my fault for believing Aunt Kate. No, Anne, it wasn't your fault. What in the world happened to you? I'm afraid I couldn't make it. I can see that. Where have you been? I got held up. Well, you could have telephoned me. I waited for you over an hour. As it happens, I had more important things to do. I don't know who you think you are. I'm not in the habit of paying for my own tea. Come along, Anne. <laughs>
I want to talk to you, Michael. Entirely late. It won't take long. What do you want to say? We can't talk down here. I realize it was very silly of me to be so annoyed with you this afternoon. I suppose you were working and couldn't help it. Is that what you came to say? Yes. All right, you've said it now. Good night. You're still angry with me. Please don't be. Let's forget about it and be friends. I don't want to see you again, Kate. Oh, Michael. Just because of this afternoon? That has nothing to do with it. Well, you can't just drop me like this. It isn't fair. It would be better for you if I do. How can you say that? You're fond of me, aren't you? Anyway, I'm very fond of you. Go home, Kate. It's silly to punish us both just because you're angry with me. Michael, you're not just trying to end things with me out of a misplaced chivalry, are you? Misplaced chivalry? What do you mean? It just occurred to me that you might think you were being unfair to go on, knowing that you're not free. Oh, I see. You mean I'm trying to drop you rather than involve you with a married man, is that it? Well, isn't it? I'm asking you for the last time. Go home before it's too late. Michael. I don't care about a lot of silly conventions. I want to be with you under any circumstances. Do you, Kate? Very well, you shall be. She had made up his mind for him. That was the end for Kate. He now began to make his plans for the revenge he'd thought of for so long. He arranged for his junior to take over his patients and established at the hospital that there was a possibility that he might not be available for the coming fortnight. He wanted to be prepared for every emergency. If something should go wrong and prevent him carrying out his plan at once, he didn't want his absence to be noticed. He left himself with only one appointment before his meeting with Kate Howard. This was a routine job of an educational nature, which he did at regular intervals as a sideline. While he was engaged on it, his mind was working out the practical problems which would be involved by this plan he'd formulated. It was a Friday night. That was going to make things easier for him. He'd arranged to pick her up at a lonely part of the embankment. On his suggestion, she'd told her friends that she was going away for a few weeks. As they drove out of London, she was full of the usual chatter, never suspecting for a moment his real feelings towards her. Until they'd actually arrived at Emma's house, she'd no idea where he was taking her. The house was for sale, he wanted to see it. She accepted this explanation. He knew that no one would answer the bell because he remembered the gardener telling him that he always went over to his sister's place on Friday nights. The window was still broken as he'd left it on his last visit. She followed him upstairs to Emma's room and over to the window out of which Emma had fallen. He drew the curtains, threw open the window. Then he told her that he was the man Emma had loved that he'd found out that she was responsible for Emma's death. And now she was going to die the same way Emma had died. He told her to throw herself out. At the last moment, she started to scream. Then she fell. This was a murder conceived in perfect sanity and faultlessly carried out. I'm afraid I've taken rather longer with this story than I'd intended. I shall have to leave the more general discussion of the subject until next time. May I ask you a question? Yes? I take it that the murderer was never suspected? No. The police could find no evidence that pointed to anything other than suicide. And yet, like all paranoics, he had to tell someone about it. 
I don't quite get that. When he told you, presumably. Yes, he was a patient of mine. In a lunatic asylum. No, he was perfectly sane. Sane as I am. You didn't mind my asking. Not at all. It was a good question. Have you been waiting? I'll take that. Where are we going? You'll see. Oh, a surprise. You went across a red light. Did I? You hate women who make up in public. I've never thought about it. So much for that as a subject of conversation. Perhaps you'd like to talk about it yourself. What was your appointment this evening? I was giving a lecture on criminology. Well, what have you got to say on that subject? I told a story about a man who killed a woman for revenge. He was carrying things a bit far. Mad, I suppose. No, he was perfectly sane. I don't know. They always have a kink somewhere, those people who do violent things. Take my sister-in-law, for example. How does she come into the argument? She must have been a bit mad to do a thing like that. Like what? Committing suicide. What makes you say it was suicide? It was an accident. What's the matter? I thought for a moment that was that awful chapel near her house. We're going to her house. Whatever for? You said it was up for sale, didn't you? Well, so it is. I might buy it. Well, what a time to choose to go look over a house. You must be demented. Out you get. Oh, do let's come back in the daytime. I want to show you something. It won't take long. Oh, all right. I'm looking to see if any of these windows are open. That's not necessary. The gardener should be here. He's taking care of the place till it's sold. There's a window broken here. You're not serious. Certainly I am. Well, anything to oblige a criminologist. Will I turn on the light? No, don't do that. It'll spoil the atmosphere. Well, which part of the house do you want to see first? Upstairs. I'd better lead the way. I know the place. I can't imagine anyone ever wanting to live here. I've always loathed it. I tried to persuade Philip to sell it long ago when he first inherited it. This was her room. That's right. How did you know? I've been here before. When? What really gave you the idea that she had a lover? She told me so. Now tell me the truth. All right. I overheard them talking on the telephone. 
I listened on the extension. Didn't you recognize the man's voice? No. But you do now. You evidently thought you were safe. That when she was dead, that was the end of the matter. Did you really imagine that I'd accept her death without making every effort to find out how it happened? Where she fell, isn't it? I don't know. I wasn't here. You tried to get money out of her because you thought she was being unfaithful. Then, when that was no good, you poisoned the child's mind against her. You might just as well have killed her yourself. You're just as guilty this way. What was that for? I don't like being locked in a room with a madman. I can get that key from you any time I like. If you don't let me out of here, I'll scream. There's no one to hear you. The gardener's here. He'll hear me. Why don't you scream, then? Because I want to give you the opportunity of letting us get out of here with dignity. The gardener goes over to his sister's on Friday nights. This is Friday night. Let me out of here. He told me so himself. That's why I picked tonight. He's not at his sister's. He's here. That's him playing the organ. No one else ever plays it. You can't do anything to me now. He'll be back soon. Not soon enough. <gasps> You're raving mad. I'm going to make you do to yourself what you did to her. Let go of me. I won't. I won't. It's like suicide. The organ stopped. He'll be back. He'll be back here.
George, why don't you park this thing crossways and nobody could get past? I just stopped to wipe my windscreen. I couldn't see. Oh, you couldn't see? What do you think I am, an owl? Where are we, do you know? Uh, yes, we're on the main Portsmouth Road. Thank goodness somebody knows. That's where I'm supposed to be headed. I can tell you how to get there. Directions in England? Are you kidding? No, thanks. I'll just follow you. Uh, no, you can't do that. I, I turn off just up the road. That's all right. I'll follow you that far. Give me a highball when you turn. Okay. Can you help me? I've run off the road. My car's ditched. I'm afraid I can't stop. I'm in a hurry. Well, perhaps it'd be good enough to give me a lift. No, I'm sorry. I'm afraid I can't. I, um, uh, I've got an urgent case. You a doctor? Yes. Well, this is luck. My name's Farrell. I've a practice here. There's a kid up the road badly injured. I've just been to telephone for an ambulance. I have to get back to her. Where are you making for? Up this way. Oh. Well, I'd better leave the car where it is and hop in with you. Oh, just a minute. I must get my bag. Uh, no, I'm just in the floor. 
The ambulance will never make it in this fog. How far are you going? I'm not quite sure where it is from here. Well, I know this district. Perhaps I can help you. No, I don't think you can. It's a long way. Are you a London man? Yes. Have you had any experience with fractured skulls? Quite a lot. Oh, could have used you tonight. Why do you have to turn up when it's too late? What could you have used me for? This kiddie I was telling you about. Road accident, was it? Yes. Lolly ran into a private car in the fog. Kitty was in the back and seemed to have taken most of the bump. She's unconscious now and bleeding from a cut over the right ear. It's very suggestive of a middle meningeal hemorrhage. Did she regain consciousness at all? Yes, she did for a time and seemed pretty well. That's what gave me a clue. Probably right. Fog seems to be lifting a bit. Yes, here's the turning. We're almost there. Well, at least I can be in at the death. I don't think I should jump to conclusions. I've seen extraordinary recoveries from head injuries. Well, I guess we've all seen extraordinary things happen, but I never expect them. And I certainly don't care one way or the other. I always thought I cared very much. I never liked losing a patient. Well, that's the sort of sentimentality you get over when you've killed as many patients as I have. I don't think so. I've always resented the fact that one can't choose. Can't choose what? Which patients to kill? Then, as a doctor, you must be in a constant state of frustration. In your case, let's say, vanity is involved, not sentimentality. But whatever it is, it's just as bad. Man doesn't have any generous feelings. He only thinks he has. Selfishness, habit, and hard cash. Those are his real motives. Looked at from that angle, life can hardly be worth living. It isn't. But I've done my share of enjoying it. Just up here. Now for another scene with the mother. Why did it have to be my daughter and all that? What's your answer to that one? Better your daughter than mine, madam, I'd say, if I were honest. How old is this girl? Oh, just a child, about 12. 12? Mm. Have you any children? No. Here we are. Stop. Oh, uh, I suppose I couldn't persuade you to look in for a moment and give a little presence to the case. It's always a great comfort to the parent to have a second opinion say there's no hope. Maybe there is hope. She's still alive, isn't she? Mm. Yeah. Is this where they are? Yes, good evening, Ma. Oh, good evening, Dr. Farrell. Terrible night, sir. Yes, isn't it? Nice mess they made of that car. Doctor, we thought you'd never get back. I, uh, I managed to get another opinion. This is Doctor, uh... Where's the patient? Oh, Doctor, she still hasn't moved. Yes, you're quite right. She's bleeding from the middle meningeal. Would she be all right? I'll operate now. What, in this place? We've got a large saucepan or fish kettle. I want to sterilize my instruments. And uh, I shall need some clean sheets. I've got my instruments in the car. not worth taking a chance. If she dies during the operation, there'll be an inquiry. And you never know how those things are going to turn out. Nobody's going to take a chance. That child's going to die in half an hour. It's no good pretending we can get her to hospital in that time. It's up to us to try and relieve the pressure before it happens. Maybe I can secure an artery. At least I can do a decompression and give you time to get her to hospital. Well, that's a job for a specialist. I wouldn't touch it. It'll be all right. Well, you was this way. We come out of the bend. We couldn't have been doing more than eight mile an hour. And there's a grinding noise and we did it. 
Ah, sure, that's women drivers all over. They never look where they're going. She was gazing at the side of the road with Tivla glance in front of her. You should have swerved over. How could we? We never saw her until she was on us. And then she was going on the wrong side of the road. Well, one of you better come with me and show me what's what. All right. It's no use thinking about that now. After all, it wasn't your fault. I had a clean license. Respiration's failing. Have you got any car, man? I don't carry it. I've got some in my car. Small box in the front pocket. was a good job. I hope so. It's your line, I suppose. Yes. She has a good fighting chance now. It gives you a feeling of elation, a feeling of control over people's destinies. You find that? Certainly not. I was trying to assess your reactions. A spectacular recovery, of course, would do my practice a world of good. Apart from that, it's all one to me whether she recovers or not. You expect everyone else to feel like that? Not you. I'm not speaking of obsessionals. I'm speaking of the normal, the perfectly sane. Let me put it this way. The vessel which we normal people use for imbibing experience is a stout austerity model, which doesn't crack. With others, like yourself, the glass, though of superior design, cracks quite easily. Now, instead of leaving it upturned on a shelf, a danger to all, it should be thrown away. I don't accept your diagnosis. Doctor dispenses death and healing with blind impartiality. He's not supposed to weigh the merits of an individual case and exercise a sense of justice. I resent that. What I did today, and you know what I'm talking about, was just. It was a gesture of independence by a sense of justice which years of professional practice have threatened with atrophy. Today I sat in judgment. Paranoia. My diagnosis was quite correct. You are mad. Who's the owner of that car outside? That must be Dr. Farrell's car. Dr. Farrell? That ain't Dr. Farrell's car. It's a big black one. That's the yellow one. 
Yes, her colour's good. Beginning to look very different. He was wonderful. I shall never be able to thank him. Where is he? I don't know. Look, Dr. She moved. Oh, we must expect that now that she intends to live. Are you the owner of that car outside? No. Who does it belong to? I don't know. Why? I nearly ran right into it. He's parked outside without a real light. Oh, is that all? Thank you. 